was one of the more important aspects when we're talking about um, green rules. So just as a quick recap, we'll kind of go over what we've learned already throughout the series. Uh, so in our first meeting, we learned about exercise and how that boosts uh, brain power. And if we all remember the activity that went with this. Jumping jacks. Yeah, they were encouraged, but not mandatory today. <laughs> Everybody stores the same information in different places, and so each brain is unique and different. And so our neurons are constantly going through the process of growth and pruning, and that is kind of uh, the main of this talk. And then the last uh, meeting we learned about attention, and that we do not pay attention to anything that's boring, and that multitasking is a myth. So today we're going to be talking And so memory is one of the most, I think, important aspects of what the brain does in terms of how we learn. Uh, because as a species, um, we have been successful mainly because of our memories. Everything we've kind of been exposed to um, is basically something we've learned firsthand or secondhand. We've kind of had to be exposed to it somehow. And we've had to retain that information somehow. How do we do it? We will not be telling you all the secrets of that, but at least we will show you some of the tricks of how the brain does what it does. It's such a complex organ that we still do not understand it fully or entirely, but certain things have happened in the past that kind of give us an inkling into what memory, um, how memory functions. So our objective today, active participants will be able to identify the stages of memor memorization, apply conditions favorable for storing memory, and evaluate how they make long-term memory more reliable. Does anyone know who this is? Okay, that's one person, anyone else? Okay. Yeah, the way he's... So that was, that was the actual Ray Man, uh, Kim Peek. Um, he died, uh, I believe it was 2008 or 9. Uh, so now he's one of the, he has one of the most um, remarkable memories um, that we've ever come across. He was born <coughs> without a corpus callosum, if you remember in your anatomy, the connection, the main connection between the left and the right side of your brain. He was born without that. He also had cerebellar defects, and they didn't think he would actually ever amount to anything or become anything. They actually told their father, you know, this is somebody just want to probably put in long-term care and not do much about. But his father persisted with him, didn't learn to walk until he was four years old. Now, the amazing thing about him, this is a real Kim Peek we're talking about, is that he spent most of the time in the library reading books, and he could read both pages at the same time with each eye, and he would remember everything he had read forever, forever. He did not forget anything he read. And he, the important thing, again, is that he actually comprehended everything he read. So he wasn't just storing useless information. He knew the importance of it, and in context, he could actually give you back that information. So that makes all of us a little bit jealous. Like, I wish, you know, that would that would really, really come useful and uh, handy, you know, at different times. So um, he was a very, very important um, as a scientific subject. A lot of people dedicated their lives to studying his memory because it kind of informed us how does memory work, what happens when new information reaches our brains, what is the brain actually doing with it. Is there any way we can improve our memories? At least kind of approximate his memory. Let's put up another subject here. Does anyone know who that is? Does anyone remember that movie? Okay, so if you remember that movie, then you kind of know where I'm heading with this. So this guy is called Henry Malayton. Now he was born, and he started to suffer um, intractable epilepsy, lots of seizures, and different um, 
different techniques had been tried to try and ameliorate procedures as, as well as they could at that time, assuming the 50s. So a neurosurgeon thought of, about a new procedure, and so he had a bilateral median um, temporal lobectomy. It worked, seizures stopped completely. However, immediately after the surgery, he was never able to form any short-term memories going forward. He was never able to learn anything new. He would meet you now, and meet you for the first time two hours later, again for the first time two hours later. So he became also another important subject in the study of memory. So exactly what was happening. So what structures in his brain were actually removed? So it was basically, and we will touch more about this as we go on, the hippocampus on both sides, which kind of informed our understanding of why that structure is very important. Needless to say, that was the first and last time that procedure was ever performed. So he was a very important subject in understanding um, how we form memories. And this movie was not based on him, but was the closest approximation to kind of what it would be like to be him. And kind of like Groundhog Day, but you're not Bill Murray, you're everyone else. You're just reliving the same day over and over and over again. This guy was trying to catch his wife's killer, but he knew he, was, he kept forgetting every time he woke up, so he kept leaving notes for himself to try and remember where he had stopped the day previously. So imagine trying to leave, your, to, to leave your life like that. It can be very, very hard. He had to learn his father died over and over again. So. 50 percent. Yes, so, so exactly. That was, I saw that one. Right there. So, that, so, that, so, this, so he was another important subject in the study of memory. Um, so as I said before, we are not going to be able to say exactly how memory works, but we can tell you some of the things that happen to make memory what it is as we know it. So with that, I'm going to. Okay, great. And I'd like to lead off with an activity, because activities are always fun. What I want everyone to do is just take a look at these nonsense words. I'll give you about 30 seconds, and I just want you to try and remember them. We'll revisit it later. Sure. So I want to ask, what does everyone think a memory is? It's kind of tough to describe, right? So I want someone to try that. It's something you've done, past experience. I mean, I think it's not answering the question, by the way. I think <laughs> that the like, best memories are like associated with some emotional happening or you know, a song or a smell or like something that just, yeah. yeah. And that and it could be like an image or an idea. So sometimes you could picture an experience or picture something. Other times you just remember facts. Yeah, they related to senses maybe like it's a it's a a smell. Do <laughs> <laughs> you remember that you forgot? <laughs> I think there's also memory, excuse me, in the sense of like the thoughts and the visceral memory, but there's also the memory of like function. Like you get in a car and you know how to drive and you don't think about it. Or you get on a bike and you ride a bike and that's memory too. So there's kind of I think the two kinds of like the emotional sensory, but there's also like the functional memory. Mm -hmm. Sounds like yeah. Jason wrote the chat. <laughs> 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 I'm going to skip ahead to the next slide. <laughs> Different types of memory. Um, in the 1850s, there was a German psychologist, his name was Hermann Ebbinghaus, and he classified two different kinds of memories. So the first is declarative memory. 
So I like to think of this as a Jeopardy game or any multiple choice exam where you are consciously recalling something. Your social security number, what you did last Tuesday, what you did in 1990, you're recalling something. But then, as Jason said, there's also non-declarative memories where if you're going to ride a bike, which is impressive that we don't have a bike example, um, you aren't remembering this is where I place my hands, this is where I put my feet, this is how I propel myself forward. Your body is just doing that automatically, so there's no conscious recollection of your moment of learning, if that makes sense. And pretty much everything we do is thanks to memory. I mean, every time we talk, we had to learn words, we had to learn letters, we had to learn the English language. Um, there's very little that we haven't learned, you know, basically what we're born with. So moving on with what we know as far as the four stages of memory. As John touched on, there isn't a whole lot of hard science, but we can break it down into four um, stages. The first is encoding. This is the moment you learn something. Um, immediately after that, you have to store it somewhere. We don't know much about these two. But then, at some point, we are asked to retrieve a memory, whether it's for an exam or something triggers a memory. But a lot of times, and always, we're eventually going to forget. Sometimes it could be seconds from now. You might have already forgotten what our objectives were for today. But you also might remember something that happened when you were five years old. So for encoding and storing, it isn't like you're filing something away in a cabinet. At our moment of learning, it's like an uncapped blender where whatever you're processing is chopped up into a million pieces and scattered all across your brain. We mentioned in the wiring chapter about everyone has a different location of Jennifer Aniston memory. It's like that. And we know this because of a patient who suffered a stroke so specific that if you asked her to write a sentence like, your cat chased a dog, she would write what you see there. She could place the consonants. She knew what she wanted to write sentence-wise. She knew what it meant. She knew where the vowels were supposed to go, but she couldn't actually write the vowels. She didn't know what the vowels were. She didn't know A, E, I, or U. So from this, we can tell that when we're encoding things and storing it, it's being spread very, very specifically in millions of different places in the brain. Something we understand a little bit better than encoding and storing is forgetting. We all know how much we forget on a day-to-day -day basis. And jumping back to uh, Herman Ebbinghaus, one of his claims to fame is to fame is the forgetting curve, where he said within 30 days, his students would forget 90% of the material that he taught them in class. And the majority of that was very early on. Even minutes after hearing it, it would be, it would be gone. Um, and this is kind of a callback to the game we played, because Herman Ebbinghaus designed that three-word nonsense <laughs> game. So I'd like everyone to try and write down as many of those three-letter nonsense words as well. We'll see how we like it. Lucas has zero. That's good. He's got one. Did anyone get more than five? Has so everyone done writing before I show the answers? Are we still Jason's thinking? No? You guys want to stand up and like slap your foot? Well, I only have six. Okay, well, sure. let's, let's just confirm. You have to, is that right? <laughs> I, don't I have Gloves. Oh, I don't I have Tess, Kerr, Dex, Ian. Well, that's how I said them. <laughs> Anyone close to that? I got six, but I spelled heck wrong. <laughs> I got an H E P. I only have five. Okay, so we have a couple people, five or greater. Anyone get zero to two? It's okay to admit. No. Okay, so about half the room, probably next to nothing. So the people who got five or more, is there anything you did memory wise, like any trick you did to try and remember? We've got a lot of different colors, we've got italics. Was there some memory trick that you used? 
The curve was easy because yeah. it was underlined, right? That's the easy one. <coughs> and the first one was first. Well, when I was just looking at them, I didn't, I didn't think I wouldn't remember them, so then I made them animals. Tasmanian daffodil, daffodil, devil, devil, leopard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kerr was a dog, even though it's not really his name. And again was Yinzer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what the deck stay for some reason. That's what I was doing too. I was thinking like SUV, but with the B, <laughs> like a, a, a BMW SUV, or you know, so I was trying to the um, Jag and Tiff. I was trying to like I remember them together, like JPEG and and there's a Piff, right? There yeah. 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 The first oh, just saying, oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, they don't. Then the first to remind me of the animals, so that's why I started there. I'm the nerd of the group. I started with Jags JPEG, and it's like, all right, well, deck computer <laughs> instead of GIF. So I, was like, I ran out of computer terms, so I only yeah. got three of them right. I somehow remembered the bold black ones. The bold black ones? Yeah. So it sounds like we had a couple different techniques to try and remember more. And Brain Rules goes into a couple different scientific bases or bases, bases um, for. <laughs> Uh, trying to remember more tricks like what you just did. So the first one, I call it the same conceit theory, brain rules doesn't call it that, but I like to think um, of a classroom example where every time you go to class, you sit in the same seat. Every time you're sitting in the same seat learning material, then exam day comes and someone's in your seat. It's not actually your seat, but you always sit there. The person sitting there thinks it's not a big deal that you just stole your seat, but you feel it's a big deal. So you sit somewhere else, you get an 80 on the exam. Interestingly, there have been a couple studies that show that there is a basis for sitting in the same seat. You can perform up to 15% better if you're repeating your original location and environment. <laughs> That's not they did a study where they, put, they, took a bunch of, uh, they took a bunch of participants to the beach, which sounds like the greatest study possible. <laughs> they put them in the water and they had them memorize words similar to what we had done earlier. If they stayed in the water when they were asked to recall it, they remembered a certain number of words. But if they went to the beach, they remembered about 15% less. Huh. And if you're thinking maybe it's just specifically water makes you remember better, they reversed it where they had them on the beach for the point of memorization, and staying on the beach helped in comparison to going into the water. Greg, there's a theory, you know, it's called propensity analysis that we see in the medical journals that is based on that philosophy. Just where you sit, there's propensity where people are attracted to. When you think about where you are right now, it, it works. But that developed into a statistical model somewhere around 15, 20 years ago. I don't know if you guys remember, but propensity analyses is, is well known. I use it probably once or twice a month. It's a very strong technique. You know, we're on because there's some affinity. We're going there. And it is even true for things that you might think be negative. You consume alcohol. Consuming alcohol will help you remember better anything that happened while you're drinking. That's also true for laughing gas. It's true for marijuana. It's true for negative things that you would think hurt your memory. If you were doing something at that point, you remember it better in that initial state. And that, there's studies for that. Well, it sounds similar to if you walk into another room, you get something, you forget what it is you walked in to get, you go back, you go back, back to where you started. Yeah. For me, that generally works when I remember, because you have that physical memory, too, then, of what you were doing when you had the thought. So you're saying the movie How High is the fact. I've not seen that movie. Red Man and some other <laughs> rapper from the 90s. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. On that note, that's another, <laughs> another word game. I want the left side of the room, so your left, not mine. I want you to close your eyes, right side, leave them open. Oh, I gotta do this. Nicole and Teresa can decide which side they want to go. I gotta keep my eyes open. Sorry. <laughs> so here are your instructions for the right side of the room. Left side. Close. 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 Good. Okay. Everyone can open their eyes back open. Open their eyes. Okay. Uh, now it's the right side of the room's turn to close your eyes while the left side gets instructions.
everyone can open their eyes. I'll give you about a minute. That may or may not have been related to our next point. We'll go back to those words in the future. But the final memory trick that I have for you is that we remember more if we are able to attach like those nonsense words to something more vivid, something more complex, which is why we're all wearing really goofy outfits today. <laughs> Hopefully you remember more. Um, that's why a lot of the things in the slides have different colors on them, a lot of pictures. We hope that that is what you're taking away. Because the more vivid the memory, the more likely you are to retain it. And you also don't pay attention to boring things, right? <laughs> so. so, kind of like to wrap up, we'll do that with a little bit of a story. Um, and the meaning of that story, there was, uh, I don't know if it's an urban legend, okay. There's a university that just had their garden done, the lawns were well manicured, fountains and everything was, um, was in place, but the contractors now wanted to put uh, pathways and walkways for everyone, but um, the college president said, no, just leave it the way it is. So they were kind of frustrated, like, we need to finish the job. He said, no, leave it the way it is. So everyone just kept using, walking on the grass to the different buildings, walking wherever. And after a year, some well-formed paths began to um, form. And after, so, so it now became just grass with some uh, dirt paths. And so those became the paths. And the college president called the contractors back. And he said, OK, now wherever you see a path, that's where you should pay. And that's where everyone started walking, because people use the most efficient ways to get from building to building. Now this video, a group of people over the five day period, they just walk the same paths over and over and over and over and over again. And well, it's an experiment, so, so it takes five days if you want to get a path. <laughs> um, <laughs> the reason why we bring this up is because whenever we're trying to talk about the first steps, what your brain does with memories, it kind of chops them up, slices and dices them, and throws them off to different parts of your brain. And so now, it, that's kind of counterintuitive to what we know memory is. Like a computer, this is a hard drive, this is where we store our memory, but our brain doesn't do it that way. It throws everything everywhere. So the neurons that respond to first pieces of information that you learn, they're kind of like your first responders, and then they go in, they take the information, and then they go back. Now, when that information is encountered again, that neuron responds again. Now, to be able to retrieve it properly, that neuron has to keep being stimulated, and so it's like beating a path into the grass. So you kind of have to repeat if you need to have success at remembering what you encountered for the first time, and that's essentially one of the things that the brain does. So what you go and say, oh, that is new, becomes one day old. Doesn't go necessarily somewhere else, but those neurons that first encounter the information, those are gonna be the neurons that you rely on to keep this information more permanent. And so with that, that takes us. That's right. So how does short-term memory turn into long-term memory? The me mechanism that guides this process is called consolidation. I like to start off by telling you a story that something that happened to me when I was about eight years old. 
So I was all excited. First of all, when I was eight, I was really tall and skinny. I was very excited because I could ride roller coasters, right? That's all the exciting point when you meet that line where you can get on the roller coaster. And for me, so we went to a theme park with one of my friends and I got on this roller coaster and you pull the bars over, but the bars stopped here um, compared to where I'm sitting being skinny eight-year-old me. So roller coaster gets going and it's going fast and I start doing loops. Well, with the bars not being close to me, I start falling out. Yeah. Yes, pretty scary. <laughs> and so my hands are getting sweaty, I'm slipping down, I'm having my feet pushed up against the seat in front of me. Luckily the man beside me sees that I'm falling out. <laughs> <laughs> and holds me in. <laughs> so um, this is a pretty emotional memory for me. Um, and it's something I thought about <laughs> for quite some time. But then, uh, and similar to Winfrey's story, when he had us last time picture us riding on the bus and getting robbed, so it was a pretty emotional event that you're able to recall a lot of details with. Just thinking about it right now, my heart's starting to race. <laughs> so, but other than that, I didn't really think about it until I returned to that theme park later when I was in high school with some friends. Luckily, that ride's not there anymore. Uh, it only lasted a couple years. I wonder why. Um, and now, if you notice on roller coasters, if you've been on one, they go all the way down to, to the till it hits the end too. So there's not a stopping point on the on the seats too, which is good. But so, what summoned my memory of this roller coaster? Well, how did I retrieve it? Well, research has told us when previously consolidated memories are recalled from our long-term memories, long-term storage, uh, the consciousness, they revert to short-term, and this is called reconsolidation. So basically when we retrieve our long-term, we re retrieve those memories, or those fragments of memories from our long-term storage, they kind of revert back to short-term memory, and the pieces start filling in, and then that memory goes back to our long-term memory. How does this happen? So like working memory that we talked about, there's some di there's different kinds of uh, long-term memory. However, unlike working memory, not much is agreed upon. But there are two ways that researchers think this occurs. One is the library um, model where it passively imagines libraries. And then the second model more aggressively imagines friends. And we're going to go into these in more detail. the library model. So you can picture your brand as like storing as a library where it stores information just like books are stacked on the shelves. So when we want to retrieve something, we use a command to pull out, um, to find a volume, to pull out that information, and once it's found, retrieved, we use that context and it's the memory is read like a book. So these memories can um, it's often used soon after learning something new, like within minutes or hours or days. Um, but then as time fades away, this memory comes to our second model, which is the crime scene. And this is more like, it becomes more of a collection of information, similar to like a collection of crime scenes of um, Sherlock Holmes. Does anyone watch the new Sherlock Holmes? So what happens to Sherlock Holmes? So a detective, Sherlock Holmes gets on a crime scene and he has partial evidence. So there's fragments of data, just like when we're trying to pull something from our memory from a long time ago. And we use information to fill in the gaps with, with this information. And so our brain uses like pattern matching to help fill in these. So sometimes it can fill in gaps into something that we already know, or it can even make up memories, disturbingly. So why does it do this? And how can we make our reliable, how can we make our long-term memory more reliable to help with less of the filling in the gaps and more of the pattern matching? Well, one method is called maintenance rehearsal. 
and this is consistently to re-exposure of the same information. For example, with that, with the activity, that first activity where we did, where we asked you to call, if you were to repeat that information, you would probably have remembered more. And so our brain can actually hold seven new pieces of information in 30 seconds. That's why license plates are seven digits, and our phone numbers are seven digits, because that's what we can recall within uh, 30 seconds. We all remember September 11th. This is an event that affected our whole nation. Can some of you tell me where you were on September 11th? Anatomy Lab. Here. Anatomy Lab. Here. Here. In the A. In the A. Bellevue Gardens in Canada. Florida. Getting pulled out of school. Getting pulled out of school. school. <laughs> well, we had school. Yep. Yeah. Me was in Spanish class and stuff every day. So why, why is it that instead of remembering what we ate for dinner last week, how can we remember this information that happened during that time? It's called elaborative rehearsal. So when you think about an event more, when you talk about an event with others, so this was on the news for a long time, we repeatedly heard this information, we talked about it, we thought about it for a long time. And because of this, we all remember where we were. Another method to help us make our long-term memory more reliable is repetitions must be spaced out, not crammed. So we all probably look like this <laughs> at some point in our lives. But when we get new information, that new information will either change its input or kind of wear down on the old memories that we have. This interference with wearing down the old memories can happen when we are cramming information, again, an overdose of information without breaks. But a lot of research has shown that when we get information in fixed repetition cycles over time, it can actually increase our knowledge base without interrupting what's already there. She studied a lot. <laughs> <laughs> she aced it and she remembered it. Next one, you guys know Tepi Lapu? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, he's one of my favorites. So Tepi Lapu, um, he sought eyes on. You guys remember her name? I had to Google it. I can't remember. Penelope. Mm -hmm. He first laid eyes on Penelope, and what happened here was his. He got excited. His presynaptic sent a signal to his postsynaptic, and he thought about her. However, what if he never saw Penelope again? Never smelled her again, never had any more input. He would eventually forget about her. However, he did not forget about her. <laughs> <laughs> he had increasing smaller inputs with her, went on dates, had built more memories with her. And this increased um, the stronger connections he had with her. And this is called late long-term vacation, which is when he first met her, it was early long-term vacation. So the process of early long-term vacation, do you know, sorry, that's just the late long-term vacation, is called synaptic consolidation. And with Pepe Le Pou and Penelope, they fell in love. This is also termed as fast consolidation, because this can actually happen within an However, two neurons cannot just form our long-term memory. It's much more complex than that, as John let us um, let us into. And the hippocampus is involved in all memory formation. And so, um, the hippocampus actually connects with. It's a two-way connection with the cortex. And when the hippocampus campus breaks the connection um, into the cortex, that is when the memory is stored permanently. <laughs> so, the inability to encode the long-term, uh, the short-term, to the long-term 
so from the hippocampus into the cortex. Um, the inability to do this is what Andrew Gray in the uh, input story had. She couldn't take her long-term memory, her short-term memory, and encode it into her long-term memory. This is very similar to the story that we heard about Henry H. M. Um, in the beginning, when he had that surgery done that affected his hippocampus. And when they studied him more, they actually found that he couldn't even remember stuff years ago. Three years ago, they were asking him things that happened in his life that he could not remember. However, he could remember everything, um, all the events in his childhood before 11 years of age. So this actually showed us that the information from long-term storage from the hippocampus into the cortex where our memories are stored can take years. However, we do forget stuff. Our brains are wired to forget irrelevant information that may be beneficial to our survival. So forgetting may have tips of the tongue, lapses, or brain farts, as I like to call them, um, absent-mindedness, blocking habits, distribution bias, suggestibility, but all this is, is our way that we can survive to make room for prioritized critical information to our survival. So forgetting also allows us to prioritize. All right, from activity two, when we had the, when we break you up in the left and right, I want everyone to write down how many words do you remember? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to find out the left side in just a minute. Oh. I remember there were nine words. <laughs> I wrote down eight. All right, so Frank, you I were can't on remember the, the nine. Right. I'm on the right. You're on the right. And you actually remembered eight. Did you write the words down? Yeah. You're on the all right. Well, you do want me to write them down? Okay. Just now. You said to write them down. Yeah, we're on the right oh, now. You're on our side? Yeah, he was, because he kept his eyes on the right side. There were nine. <laughs> I don't remember. All right. There's three. Stop writing. Oh. One. Okay. So how many words did you write, Lucas? Three. 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 None. I forgot whether. Oh. Oh. All right, Frankie is our. But you team. said that. But, but you wait. You said you, the diagonal. So I only picked the the like the letter, and then I added the word later. Apple has a diagonal in it. That yeah. was the kit. That was the the clue, right? Well, you just had you to count said, the diagonal lines. All right. So and we'll go over that in just the left side. So Janice, six. six. She was on the left. She was on the left. Greg, you got it. Right. So, so left side definitely six. got more. Like, um, so left side was asked to think about the meaning of the word. So similar to how Dr. Freelander was saying that she made the word, that knows nonsense words into animals, that was, that's what made it meaningful to her. So we actually asked them to rate on a scale of one to ten how much you liked or disliked the word. Um, so by adding meaning to a word, whether it be the scale or something else with animals, it makes it more meaningful and therefore you tend to remember more. However, with the right side, we asked them to determine the number of letters that have diagonal lines in them and the number of letters that do not. So they just looked at the word and they were counting different lines and they tend not to remember as many words. Frank's an exception. He's the outlier. 
Sorry. I didn't do it right. <laughs> no, you did it right. <laughs> so the same key points that we want you to take away with this. It takes years to consolidate a memory. Not minutes, hours, days, but years. So what you learned in the first grade is actually not even formed until your sophomore year of high school. What? Probably get you on the high smart end. Medina's dream school. So Medina was the author of Brain Rules. And his vision of how school or learning actually is that the school is one that repeats what was learned, not at home, so not taking learning it and then going at home and doing homework, but actually during the school day, 90 to two hours later, um, repeat the initial, what, was, what initial learning occurred. Our, our schools are currently designed so that most of the learning has to occur at home, which is several hours after they learned the initial information. So he is this almost like, you spend 30 minutes learning the subject, then you spend 30 minutes on another, and then the third, and then you repeat that. That first one, that second one, that third one, throughout the day to help repeat to learn. So, how do you remember better? Repeated exposure to information, and specifically time intervals, provides the most powerful way to stick a memory into your brain. So again, repeating, spacing it out, and then forgetting. Forgetting allows us to prioritize events, but if you want to remember, remember to repeat. All right, any questions? Any minds like, wow? So today we learned uh, brain rules five and six. Short-term memory, repeat to remember, and long-term memory, remember to repeat. Our next session will be on the generation of